let me brief you about the inaugural session. We will begin with welcome remarks by DJ ICWA, Ambassador Dr. T.C. Raghavan. The first session will be chaired by Ambassador Satinder K. Lamba, former Indian High Commissioner to Pakistan and Chairman Ananta Aspen Center, New Delhi. There are two distinguished panelists, Mr. Senge H. Sering, Director, Institute for Gilgit Baltistan Studies, Washington, D.C., and Dr. Ashok Behuria, Senior Fellow and Coordinator, South Asia Center, IDSA, New Delhi. I will also share my views on the subject. Now I would like to request DG ICWA Ambassador Dr. T.C. Raghavan to kindly give his welcome remarks. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Lamba, uh, Senge Sering, Ashok Behuria, uh, my colleague Ashish Shukla. Uh, may I begin by saying that it is a matter of great gratification that we are holding this uh, seminar today on the ICWA. Uh, and I am uh, gratified for two particular reasons. Firstly, the Council, the Indian Council of World Affairs, uh, has a long association with uh, scholarly work on, uh, on Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, uh, some of you may recall that the classical work on this subject by Sisir Gupta, which is called Kashmir, a study of India-Pakistan relations, was in fact commissioned by the Council in 1956. Uh, it took him almost a decade to uh, decade to publish it. It came out in 1966 or 1967. Since then has remained in print and it remains one of the uh, true classics on the, on the subject. And if I may say, perhaps a single monograph of that kind which brings the story up to date about Jammu and Kashmir between India and Pakistan in the United Nations has not really been uh, has not really been attempted and certainly no such single monograph uh, exists. The second reason why I'm very pleased that we are able to hold this conference, this conference is that in the contested terrain of India-Pakistan relations, there are so many issues which suck the oxygen out of the room. Uh, there's, there's terrorism, there's a whole host of other bilateral issues, there's the very large area of people-to-people -people contacts, that the question of Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir receives uh, uh, relatively much less attention and very much less uh, focus. So our attempt today by this uh, day-long uh, conference is to look at recent developments in uh, Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir uh, for, for younger members of the audience and especially uh, students who regularly attend our functions, I think it will give them an opportunity to acquaint themselves with the aspect of our history, which is not otherwise uh, uh, very well uh, known. Although all the facts are there, but nevertheless, not all of it is uh, uh, very, uh, very well uh, known. So the sessions of this seminar have been structured to look at both these aspects, the historical aspect as also the contemporary situation and the factors which lie behind the contemporary situation. So I'm very grateful to Ambassador S.K. Lamba, former High Commissioner of India to Pakistan, for chairing this uh, inaugural uh, session. I should uh, mention for the benefit of the audience that Mr. Lamba possibly holds, not possibly holds the record for being the longest serving Indian diplomat uh, in Pakistan. Many of us have tried to uh, beat his record, but so far nobody has uh, succeeded. Uh, uh, this session will look at internal developments in Gilgit Baltistan, and I should say that within the relatively sh uh, short shrift which uh, uh, Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir gets, most of the attention there is taken over by Mirpur and uh, Muzaffarabad. Gilgit Baltistan receives even less uh, attention. And one example for that, for instance, is that in 2004, 2005, 2006, when we devoted, uh, it was a time of creative diplomacy between India and Pakistan, uh, while a great deal of attention was put in uh, to the Srinagar Muzaffarabad uh, bus service and trade service, and similarly the Punch uh, uh, Ravalakot uh, trade and bus uh, services, why the Kargil Kardu bus 
and trade uh, service could not open remained an unanswered uh, question. And somehow, Gilgit Baltistan has not received the attention, both in terms of scholarship as also in terms of uh, public advocacy uh, and in the media, which it should have. So I'm very glad that this session, uh, and of course the next one, we, we, we try to focus within the larger context of Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir on developments in Gilgit Baltistan uh, in particular. And we have uh, uh, three well-known experts, uh, Dr. Ashok Behuria of IDSA, who is uh, possibly uh, one of the best informed persons in India about this particular uh, sub-region. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Senge Sering uh, from the Institute of Gilgit Baltistan Studies based in Washington, D.C. And I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Sering, for taking the trouble to come all the way uh, to Delhi. The third uh, presentation is by my colleague, Dr. IC, Dr. Ashish Shukla of the ICWA on Gilgit Baltistan's new dynamics uh, as a result of the expanding Chinese uh, presence. The post-lunch session will be chaired by Ambassador uh, G. Parsarthi, also a former High Commissioner to Pakistan. Uh, and uh, uh, he is someone, incidentally, who has seen Pakistan from two different axes. He has served both in Karachi as also in Islamabad. Uh, and in that we will have Mr. Dalat Ali speaking on Talibanization. And again, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, with gratitude Mr. Dalat Ali your efforts in coming all the way from the UK to join us here uh, today. We have Dr. Wariku again, one of our acknowledged experts on the subject and I'm very grateful to him that he made a lot of effort to change his schedule to be present here uh, today. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Uh, D. Bhattacharya ji, who will be speaking on exploitation of water and mineral resources uh, 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 in Gilgit, uh, Baltistan. Again, a subject about which we know relatively little, because what is happening to uh, rivers in uh, Gilgit Baltistan and the environmental and other consequences of the way they are being managed is something which I think we need to focus much more uh, attention on. Uh, each of these sessions will add to our knowledge of Gilgit Baltistan and its own uh, specific uh, dynamics. The concluding session in the evening, in the late afternoon, uh, is a lecture on a forgotten aspect of our history by Mr. Raghven Singh, uh, presently Secretary to the Government of India and the Ministry of Textiles. But he has earlier served as Director General of the National Archives of India and is an acknowledged scholar. Uh, he has a book coming out about uh, developments in the Northwest frontier in 1946-1947 and the question of how uh, the book is titled, incidentally, The Lost Frontier. Uh, and it's essentially about how a Congress dominated uh, province by a series of manipulations uh, ended up being part of uh, Pakistan. Uh, and it's an interesting question which, which he has explored in that book. But his talk today is about Gilgit in 1946-1947. And, and as I said, this is one aspect of our history which we need to focus on much more. And I do hope there will be a number of students uh, who will be present in the evening to hear him. So with these preliminary remarks, may I hand over to Ambassador Lamba to conduct uh, the session today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, again, for your presence here. So we should do it from here only. We should do it from here. Right. Thank you. <coughs> Ambassador Raghwan, Mr. Senge Sering, <coughs> Mr. Ashok Veria, and Ashish Shukla, and a large number of friends whom I see here, good morning. Well, I'm delighted to be here on a subject which I've always felt we have neglected here. And uh, I'm glad that the ICWA is today having a full day session on this. <coughs> Raghun referred to me as the longest serving diplomat in Pakistan. I just want to tell you that either age or duration should never be taken a certificate. That is my advice to you. Uh, uh, so go by what he says. He's a recent returnee from there. His knowledge will be better than mine. 
Well, friends, I am moderating the session and a moderator, uh, I was wondering as I was coming what a moderator should do. I think a moderate, as a moderator, I like to set the tone for the three uh, presentations that will follow. So uh, I'd like to tell you something about um, the uh, Gilgit Baltistan in, this, in that context. One, Gilgit Baltistan has, was a part of the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. Two, Northern Areas is the name that Pakistan gave to Gilgit Baltistan after 1947. Three, there are two passes, Skardu to Kargil and Kapla to Leh, which link uh, <clears throat> Gilgit Baltistan with JNK. Four, we welcome Ambassador Parthasati, uh, and four A then becomes uh, none of the constitutions of Pakistan have mentioned that this is uh, part of Pakistan. I'm specifically mentioning because I'll come to that. The tragic history started in 1947 when Maharaja Hari Singh sent Gansara Singh as governor and a man called Major Brown decided on his own as uh, the head of the scouts uh, with the help of the Muslim scouts to arrest him. And he asked the Pakistan government to appoint a governor. And they sent a man called Shah Alam, a tehsildar from NWFP to be the governor. And that is how northern areas or Gilgit Baltistan have since been tre treated. A tehsildar was made governor. Major Brown was given a Pakistani title and an OBE at the same time. So you could call it a British-Pakistani conspiracy which started the tragic history. The next important event was the Karachi Agreement which started the subservience of Pakistan, uh, of POK to Pakistan. Uh, divided Gilgit Baltistan from the rest of POK and gave all powers to Islamabad. Why I'm mentioning this is that this was signed by Sadar Ibrahim Khan, who before his death said, I never committed that sin. I'm quoting him. I never committed that sin. I did not sign that agreement. And if you want more details, please see Kashmir Times, 2003, May 5, page 6, if I remember correctly. But later on, if these dates are wrong, I'll check with my record before leaving and let you know. But I think that was the date. We next move to the piecemeal changes that took place. Uh, I'm just giving you because uh, uh, the first chapter is the angst of why were all this problem what happened next? Piecemeal changes by Bhutto and all the General Zia. All of a sudden decided that Gilgit Baltistan was not a part, was a part of Pakistan. He told Kuldeep Nair on April 1, 1982, that these are not disputed areas. And on April 3, he announced that three observers from these areas will be appointed to the Majlis Ashura. The then Indian charge affair immediately protested two days later. And when he protested, the Pakistan Foreign Secretary laughed. And he conveyed this to Delhi that they haven't taken him seriously. So the next day, the official spokesman uh, issued a statement in Delhi. And also, uh, the Pakistani ambassador was called. But even that wasn't considered enough. It was brought to the notice of the then External Affairs Minister, who on April 15, Mr. P. V. Narasimha Rao, uh, made a sua moto statement in the Lok Sabha, saying that our policy is what was stated by our Shahjad Affair and by the uh, Ministry, and the Gilgit Baltistan is a part, and there's no question of uh, our accepting observer. 
just to tell you those observers were not appointed. For not because of our protest, also for other reasons. We move on. Uh, Gilgit Baltistan, different problems, and then attempts to amalgamate them, and the recent developments which you will hear is. I next move to uh, the sectarian situation there. Till the 70s, it was a safe place. Kashmiriyat was there. The first time that there was problem was in 1975 when uh, f from a Sunni mosque there was firing on a procession, Muharram procession. 1998, 20 years later, again problems of the sighting of the moon led to communal disturbances. And these continued. Uh, nine, uh, 2014 killing of mountaineers and other. I'm just refreshing your memory. Uh, um, why all this happened? Three reasons to my mind. One was the Karakrom Highway brought in arms, brought in militia, and the religious uh, persecution started. Two, the SSR was changed, which changed the demography of the area. And the third, I've already mentioned to you that Gilgit-Baltistan had been separated from uh, the rest of POK. And the last thing is China's role. You know, the, China, I should have mentioned to you right at the beginning when I mentioned 4A, but when my friend Partha came, I forgot to tell you the fifth point that uh, while JNK, all the three have remained as one entity, in Pakistan, POK was divided in three parts. Gilgit-Baltistan, the so-called Azad Kashmir, and the third, you will ask which one, is the 5,000 kilometers given to China in 1963. So there were three parts it was divided. So China was very keen that there should be more federal control. And China's thing started in 1963, but in 1963 the agreement, if you see it, Articles 1, 2, and 6, is very clear that they accepted that Pakistan didn't have a role, that it could be, uh, didn't have sovereignty, that they would decide it later on. But later on, their attitude changed. particularly after the CPEC. The CPEC, the normal route for the CPEC should have been from, uh, the shortest route from Gwadar to Kashgar would be, if you look at the map, uh, Panjgir, Khob, Koita, uh, Dera Ismail Khan, then into Punjab, Miawali, then Islamabad, then the Karakrum Highway, and then to think yeah. You know, that's a, but China didn't want, and so did Khyber Pakhtunwa, and Sin didn't want, so it all went through Punjab. Well, I have, uh, you will have a detailed, I don't want to get into all that at the moment, but China had a role in making, increasing the federal control over the area. And that was the latest uh, thing th that happened. And so I have given you a brief idea of what the three presentations that will follow. And I think my role as a moderator ends there. And now, as per the program, I will request Dr. Ashok Veria, <coughs> who is well known to all of you, senior fellow and coordinator at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, his office brings out a regular newsletter on uh, POK, and those who don't get it uh, should ask him to get in touch with him to get it, because that is one of the uh, few available uh, information on a regular basis of the area. Ashok. Thank you, Thank you sir. <coughs> Thank you, sir. I, I really feel intimidated. Uh, to speak to you on this issue in front of uh, people like uh, Ambassador Lamba, Ambassador Path Sarathi, and few others in the audience who have dealt with this issue uh, uh, as a part of their professional career. Uh, 
but we are uh, in IDSA uh, sir referred to now we have a POK studies program and which is uh, which has been there for last about 11 years now and uh, it is brought out uh, in a monthly uh, manner now and you can access the documents uh, from the web idsa.in uh, we do also uh, bring out uh, a regular uh, coverage from the Urdu media as well, vernacular media from Pakistan as well, that is also put out in the web. So it's, it's easily available on the web. Uh, for those who uh, want to be included in the mailing list, uh, they can send it to me. Having said that, let me first, you know, because I, was, I have been given this uh, responsibility to walk you through the recent developments in Gilgit Baltistan. I, I believe the, uh, partly uh, the history has been covered by Ambassador Lamba and I believe in the evening uh, Mr. Raghavendra Singh will also give us a heavy dose on the, the, the developments uh, in 1946 and 47 and uh, as you know uh, it was during the imperial times it was regarded as uh, uh, as an important frontier uh, and that is how the great game, the concept of great game came about and if you look at the way the British managed it you know from 18, uh, I, I would say precisely from 1840s onwards you know, uh, 1870s onwards rather uh, it was fascinating, it was interesting how they were so uh, nervous about possible Russian and Chinese intrusion into this territory uh, if you look at it today also, if, if you cut out Gilgit Baltistan and, in, and just make a mental map of it, you have you know, four different countries around it. Of course, it is part of, legally part of the Indian uh, Kashmir, so it is part of us. Uh, but if you look at the other countries, China, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, you know, abutting it in all other three uh, directions, uh, it's an important... Uh, uh, what I would say strategic uh, uh, locale even today and that is how uh, it is being viewed by uh, China, India, Pakistan and Central Asian countries as well. Uh, it is uh, during the earlier times if you go back in history you will find an interesting account like when the uh, Raja of Jammu was given back his uh, domain uh, he, the first thing had he did was to go to Gilgit and uh, conquer uh, the, 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 the connecting route you know, which was part of the Silk Route at that point of time which was the route uh, to rest of India which was, uh, and that was the commercial route that was important for them to acquire uh, because that would have added to their revenue at that point of time and uh, as you know uh, uh, maybe Mr. Singh will talk more about it uh, but if you look at the, that terrain, it is very interesting. It is, it is an ethnic boiling pot, or rather a melting pot, you can call it. There are so many ethnicities out there, so many languages out there. And if you look at the colonial history, you will find that, you know, all these areas, you know, basically now there are three divisions, Diamer, uh, Gilgit and Baltistan. Uh, but if you look at the uh, principalities that were there, uh, Diamer consisted of about 12, 13 principalities at one point of time. Uh, so were the other uh, areas as well. And you must have heard about the Hunja and Naga and the fight between them and the fight uh, that they had with uh, the British uh, at one point of time or other. So that was very fascinating. The, the, the hold of the British in this terrain was very tenuous. It was never complete. The only way you can say that you know they had some kind of control uh, was between 1935 and 1947. Uh, and after the uh, um, uh, lapse of paramountcy, we have seen how Major Brown came in and how things happened. Uh, but after that, if you look at the way Pakistan absorbed it, you know, first was, you know, 28th April 1949 Karachi Agreement, as Sar pointed out. And uh, later on, it was sliced off from the Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir, or Pakistan occupied Kashmir, as we call it, POK, as we call it. And it was converted into a stateless domain. It was not part of uh, Pakistan. Even today, also, you know, you, you don't find it mentioned in the constitution. 
and I'll come to that later how things uh, developed around that because uh, I would believe that from the, from the very first day there was a class of perceptions uh, between uh, the people of uh, Gilgit Baltistan and, and, the, and the rulers in Pakistan because people in Gilgit Baltistan would always like to be autonomous, stay autonomous and uh, carve out a confederal space in the Pakistani political setup. Uh, but the Pakistanis were out to swallow it uh, all the time. And uh, uh, it started with a Tehsildar, then it went uh, on to a political agent, then it became a joint secretary in the Ministry of Kashmir Affairs. And after that, from 1980s, uh, 90s, you find you know, some uh, uh, rudimentary representative system uh, being introduced, uh, and which culminated in 2009, uh, the self-empowerment uh, uh, act by the PPP government. Uh, but if you look at the popular reaction to all this, right from 1947 till today, the pe people have been very, very dissatisfied with the way this federal arrangement has been worked out. Uh, Semi-quasi-federal, I would say, uh, arrangement has been... Uh, and they would always compare their status with the status that Ajat Jammu and Kashmir, so-called Ajat Jammu and Kashmir, enjoys in the scheme of things. Because they always think that AJK people had a better bargain. We haven't had a better bargain. Uh, from 1974 uh, onwards, the interim constitution that came about, at least it had a semi-provincial uh, status, uh, AJK. But... Uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan was not given anything uh, in a corresponding manner. So there was always this ruse about you know, not being given uh, as much autonomy as they deserved. Uh, and uh, with, uh, as it happens with, you know, uh, with increasing dose of representational government being given to people, like you see in the Indian case also 1905, then you know, how it panned out by 1947, people thought that we should be a full-blown democracy and all. Similarly, if you look at the, the 2009 order, I think from 2009 onwards, the people of that terrain have been looking for much more, much better bargain from the Pakistani state. I'll come to that later, but first let me give you a sense of why this sense of uh, being left out has developed in the people of uh, Gilgit Baltistan. I will, I will give you some statistics. You know, the statistics are like this. I will not touch upon the sectarian issue because Senge will talk about that. Uh, but if you look at the statistics, let us uh, come to the socio-economic uh, data uh, uh, and that will give you a sense of how they have been uh, governed by or misgoverned by the Pakistani state. Uh, in fact, you know, you do not get a uniform data from Pakistani sources on uh, Gilgit Baltistan. Uh, Pakistan Institute of Peace Studies, PIPS, which is run by my good friend Rana, it go comes out with a uh, figure, uh, the literacy rate is so poor, abysmally poor. They say only 14% of the men in the area are literate. And compared to that, only 3.5% of the women are literate. But the government of Gilgit Baltistan has a separate statistics. They say about 37.85% of the people are literate, out of which 52.6% are male and 21.65% are female. But if you look at the Pakistani statistics, it, is, it, it comes to 60%. So there, there are three sets of data. You don't know which one to trust. Maybe you will throw some light on it. Uh, the Pakistani sources say that the, uh, the overall literacy rate is about uh, 60%. They, they say it is 59.75 or something like that. Where the male uh, account for 70% 70, 70 of the uh, literacy there and female only 50%. So this is something that you know you have to keep in mind. You know how uh, this this data about statistics about you know uh, socioeconomic data about uh, Gilgit Baltistan has also been manipulated uh, in a in a major way. Uh, if you look at uh, the condition of the public schools in the area, it is pathetic. 
girls education uh, is discouraged and with the uh, with the coming in of uh, this uh, uh, radical uh, element uh, this has become difficult for the girls to receive education as well uh, aga khan's uh, institutions are doing a great job in spreading education but they are uh, limited to different locales if you come to health you know there are about 33 hospitals in whole of gilgit baltistan uh, with only 986 beds the total population of the terrain is about 2 million uh, at the moment uh, so they have only 33 hospitals and about 986 beds uh, and this is uh, this is something i have taken from a world bank source and that is about one uh, bed for about one doctor for about 6000 uh, people in that terrain but the pakistan government figure says that there is one doctor for every 3814 persons in gilgit baltistan uh, but interestingly if you look at the pakistani figures they have one doctor for every 2200 uh, persons the pakistani figure Uh, but the pog figure is uh, like this even if, even if you go by their own statistics it is uh, less than uh, the national average uh, and there is one hospital for about 1220 people as the calculations say coming to the economic uh, scenario uh, 85% it is again the world bank data i have quoted 85% of the people live on subsistence farming but if you look at the pakistani data not the pok data either uh, gilgit baltistan data the pakistani data says only 23% of the people live in the poverty line and they, oh, we all know how poverty lines are defined in our part of the world uh, so they say 23% but people from gilgit baltistan would tell us that it is much larger the unemployment unemployment rate is also very huge and uh, it is certainly larger than the pakistani average so that is what you know that is a ruse that the people of gilgit baltistan have vis a vis pakistan uh, in this context and i i was referring to 2009 uh, empowerment act which was uh, brought out by the ppp government the immediately after that you found ppp government found a way of imposing taxes on the people earlier there were no tax direct taxes now direct taxes were levied on the people of gilgit baltistan and that is what has led to the sentiments which have crystallized in the shape of the movements that we get to see on the streets now and uh, you find that there is a growing number incidents of suicides because of unemployment this is what some some of the people say uh, some of the social activists from the region they tell us and they also say in addition to all this there is a sense of discrimination about workers from gilgit baltistan that the locals are paid 25% less salary than the officials who come to govern them from pakistan's uh, other provinces from punjab from khyber pakhtunkhwa and the like and 90% of the people who are there they are engaged in agriculture and there are also ecological issues that have come to the fore uh in 1998 about 640000 hectare of land was under forest cover uh, that was forest land and today it is about it has shrunk to about 285000 hectares so there is uh, this you know unrepentant uh, exploitation of uh, natural resources uh, and the, and the in the benefits of it is not accruing to the people in the region and most of the people that have come of age from gilgit baltistan would argue that it is colonialism at work nothing else so there is a genuine sense of grievance about it now let me come to the the political aspect of it how it all manifested we all know that you know in may 28th 1999 the supreme court of pakistan came out with the verdict and he they acknowledged that northern areas constituted part of the state of jammu and kashmir so they didn't leave anything to guess they said that it is part of jammu and kashmir and they said that the proper administrative and legislative steps should be taken by the government of pakistan to ensure the people of northern areas
enjoy their rights under the Pakistani constitution. And following that, Musarraf came out with this uh, Northern Area Legislative Council Act and uh, representative system was introduced and in 2009 it was given a further uh, uplift and uh, you came out, they came out with uh, uh, is some empowerment and self-government order, as I told you, where there was a GB council, Gilgit Baltistan council, which ruled uh, the, the, the area, and it consisted of 15 members, that was the executive uh, wing of the government, six of whom were to be elected from Gil Gilgit Baltistan Legislative Assembly, and the rest were elected from the Pakistani assemblies. So you, know, you, you, you out of 15, nine were from Pakistan, six were from Gilgit Baltistan. So that was the way it was structured. So I, I mean to say that you know the hold of Pakistan was very strong here. After 2012, when the taxes were imposed, the locals they came up in revolt. The GB Legislative Assembly passed a resolution demanding provincial status within Pakistan. The, the, the latest round of uh, demonstrations that you get to see or hear about is because of this. That most of the people, they're saying that we should rather be granted provincial status so that we will have more allocations and we will be better cared for by the central government. And that set off a debate after this resolution came about in the GB Legislative Assembly. In, uh, in April 2014, the Standing Committee of the Senate on Human Rights took notice of the human rights violations in GB, courtesy the sectarian uh, violences, violence and all. And they, they made a special reference to the constitutional deprivation of the people of Gilgit Baltistan. <coughs> and if you look at uh, the reactions from different people uh, at that point of time, they were all saying that Pakistani parliament should take note of our distress. And they, they were basically trying to argue that the Pakistan has left us high and dry. They should come back and include us in the national uh, mainstream and we should be part of Pakistan. In 2012, very interesting uh, thing, if, uh, nugget of fact, a retired colonel named Imtiazul Haq whose father had once upon a uh, time served in the Gilgit Scouts uh, and had rebelled against the Maharaja in 1947. He came out with a dissertation. The dissertation was very interesting. The dissertation was titled Determining the Political Status of Gilgit Baltistan, Future Prospects. And Colonel Imtiaz was made one of the members of the committee which was set up by the GB government to make recommendations to the, uh, on, the, on the constitutional status of Gilgit Baltistan. His recommendations were very revealing, very interesting. After batting for absorption into the Pakistani state, he came out with this observation that it may not be possible for government of Pakistan to take a U-turn on its principled stand on the subject and integrate Gilgit Baltistan in its constitutionally defined territories due to its commitments with the people of Jammu and Kashmir, United Nations, India and the international community. However, provision of interim provincial status, we came out with a, came out with a uh, term, interim provincial status, right of vote and due representation in the constituent assemblies of Pakistan is the best viable option to address the issue of identity crisis in the, amongst the people of Gilgit Baltistan. And after that, the Gilgit Baltistan Bar Council took this issue up and they uh, laid several demonstrations and they argued that Gilgit Baltistan has been made a sacrificial goat in the name of Jammu and Kashmir. And this is a malified intention of the government, keeping the area and the people under clutches of Pakistani bureaucratic system depriving the people of their basic fundamental rights. And they said, the Bar Council said, the Azad Jammu and Kashmir compared to us, as I told you earlier, which was liberated, liberated by the Pakistan army, that was the, I am quoting Adhor Watim, with the help of the tribal Laskar, is comparatively in a better position compared to GB, 
it has an act based governing system at work since 1969 and 74 even if they do not have a constitutional status and this should be granted to us as well uh, they also made another interesting statement they said the pattern of political governing system in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir they call it prevailing since 1948 and 1957 is the most suitable and viable in this regard as the same will not only cater to the strategic interests of Pakistan in this region but also redress the prolonged sense of deprivation amongst the people of GB as well so there was a grudging recognition of the uh, rights uh, granted to uh, people in Jammu and Kashmir state of India so in 2015 the Gilgit Baltistan chief secretary headed a committee and they also pre prepared a document on in this regard a final report on this regard and in this also Imtiaz was a part and the committee recommended interim or provisional, provisional status to Gilgit Baltistan with right of vote and representation in the parliament of Pakistan is the best option and there are other recommendations for want of time I will not walk you through them but I can only tell you that all this created a pressure on uh, the government of Pakistan and they came out with the Sartaj Aziz committee uh, which was formed to look into the possibility of granting provincial status to Gilgit Baltistan and it came out with its uh, report in uh, 2017 uh, December November 2017 and in between when this was being discussed you found uh, Yashin Malik shooting of that letter to Nawaz Sarif saying that how can you do it uh, you, you know pending uh, resolution of the Kashmir issue you shouldn't uh, grant provincial status to uh, Gilgit Baltistan and uh, Nawaz Sarif wrote back saying that you know we will take your uh, concerns into account while framing our policies so when finally the uh, report came out the report had talked about interim provincial status but without mentioning provincial quote unquote in the in the in the process and in May 2018 just before the demitted office as uh, Khakan Abbas's government came out with the uh, that um, May 2018 uh, Gilgit Baltistan report something like that act I'm just I'll quote advert him they come out with Gilgit Baltistan order of 19, uh, 2018 May it was it was promulgated on 21st May 2018 but immediately after that you had a change of guard in Islamabad and as soon as Imran Khan came to power he took up the case and informed the Supreme Court that uh, this act cannot be implemented and the Supreme Court took it up from November uh, 16 2018 onwards and it deliberated on it you had a very activist uh, Chief Justice at that point of time and uh, he uh, was very emotionally involved with uh, Kashmir issue and, and he went uh, begging for uh, funds to build uh, the dam uh, Dam or Vasa Dam uh, he, uh, he said that you know you uh, cannot uh, stop the people from enjoying their rights uh, I'm not going to go <coughs> the Supreme Court order which came out in January 2019 is very interesting the Supreme Court judgment uh, quotes its earlier judgment in 1999 as, you, as I told you and it says that not just to provide judicial imprimatur to the order but to give it permanence the order that uh, I'm talking to you about the order which was brought out by the Khakan Abbasi administration Khakan Abbasi government he said that it should be given some kind of a permanence the proposed order should neither be amended after due promulgation except in terms of the procedure provided in the article 124 of that order he said that the, uh, the government should ensure that whatever reservations it has on the order that was promulgated on May 2018 it should bring about the changes but in a manner 
that this will not be amended again, excepting uh, after the uh, decision of the Supreme Court on the matter. So this is something that Supreme Court has now got a stake in the order, that the order can only be amended if Supreme Court is convinced that you know, the changes need to be made in light of the Article 20, 124 which concerns amendment of the thing. So this proposed order also which has come out now, it says that you know the Supreme Court's order should be made part of the preamble of the order. Now the Supreme Court has taken a stand that the Pakistan government even if it is, it recognizes the problem of Pakistani government in according uh, provincial status to Gilgit Baltistan, but it says that Pakistani government will, Pakistan government will find a way of ensuring uh, that the people of Gilgit Baltistan enjoy the rights as per the constitution of uh, Pakistan. Uh, now the situation is like this: the people from Gilgit Baltistan still do not uh, regard this order as something which will satisfy their demands. They, wow. they, they would say that no taxation without representation, that was their cry. You know, if you look at the demonstrations, uh, they were saying that no taxation without representation. Either Pakistan will have to find a way of, you know, uh, not uh, taxing them, not imposing direct taxes on them, or granting them some kind of a representation. We have heard uh, from Ambassador Lamba how Jia's proposal also ran into rough weather, you know, because Jia wanted uh, some observers to be uh, there from Gilgit Baltistan in the Majlis Sisura Pakistan, but that didn't come about. And given the uh, kind of emotional outburst that we get to see from Pakistan on the Kashmir issue now, I don't think they will be able to give them full provincial status. But they will bring about certain, uh, I think, between provincial status and uh, the order, they will find some via media perhaps. Uh, and this will keep the pot boiling at the popular level. Uh, having said that, let us analyze how things are developing out there. We as a nation, we as a country, have left our hold on the terrain from 1947 onwards. We have only taken episodic interests in the terrain, depending on our relationship with Pakistan and issues that come to the fore. Otherwise, we have left it to Pakistan. And this is something that we have to recognize. Apart from issuing some uh, ritual statements <coughs> from the foreign office, we haven't done anything significant which will attract the people of the terrain towards us. If you look at the uh, population that is focused on, that is demanding national, uh, na national recognition, national, uh, recognition on the basis of the nationalism, the nationalists, they are very few and far between, very few. I think the majority of the people you know, there was a there was a there was a, a survey which was undertaken in 2015 or 16. Saying it, I think uh, I don't some, know. Uh, there was a, there was a, by some European uh, institution. I think they skipped Gilgit. Only and they skipped Gilgit, but they were in Baltistan, and they said that in Baltistan about 80 to 90 percent of the people they want to be part of Pakistan, and they want to uh, uh, they want uh, Pakistan to recognize Gilgit Baltistan as its fifth province. So we should recognize that the, 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 the dissatisfaction that is emanating from non-fulfillment of this demand is huge. And in the days of asymmetric uh, strategy that you are going to employ vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, if you are intent to do that, you know, the, the, uh, this is something that can be perhaps tapped. That must have, uh, because we do not distinguish between you know, demonstrations. Demonstration आ गया देख लिए हैं कि इतने आ रहे हैं वो पचास साठ लोग भी खड़े हैं सौ लोग खड़े हैं हजार लोग खड़े हैं then we stand up and say that oh there is lot of you know reservations there against Pakistan but we should try to measure the the quality of that reservation or the dissatisfaction or disaffection so point I'm making is in 2008 2009 IDSA had come out with a position paper on this 
and we had pushed it to the government where we argued that if we want you know, to build our bridges with people in that terrain we should try to look at Gilgit-Baltistan not as a territory alone but as a territory with people in it and we have to find a way of building our contacts with the people out there one way of that would have been you know to grant scholarships to people out there uh, encourage them to visit our uh, country these are some of the people uh, called me uh, in, 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 in NSCS and that those days they told me that you are being idealistic this is not possible but these are some of the ways in which you could reach out to the people out there to build bridges with them. Otherwise, we can only episodically wake up to uh, this reality and put something out on the table which uh, doesn't have any basis, uh, you know, as far as Gilgit Baltistan is concerned. Because as, you, as I told you, today the war cry there is to be integrated with Pakistan as the fifth province of Pakistan. And the resulting antipathy, resulting disaffection, can we harness it, can we use it as an asymmetric strategy? That, that remains for us to see, that remains for policymakers to see. But I'll, I'll stop here, maybe we can uh, discuss it during the Q&A. Thank you. You, you have raised some interesting points and what you mentioned towards the end and the unanswered question from Director General Raghavan, when he spoke about why there was in 2004-06 no contact with the um, Gilgit-Baltistan, simply because when these routes were decided for trade and travel, Pakistan didn't want the Skardu Kargil route to be, for two reasons. One, they didn't want Gilgit-Baltistan to open to us. Secondly, if you look at the, which the next speaker will enlighten us, that in Gilgit Baltistan, the three communities, Ismailis live predominantly in Honza, Shias live predominantly in Skardu, and Sunnis live predominantly in Daimar. So, Skardu was the area where they didn't want the people to come into contact. Anyhow, with that, may I now request uh, our next panelist. Uh, Mr. Singh Sering, Director of the Institute for Gilgit Baltistan Studies in Washington, D.C. As Ambassador Raghavan mentioned, we are grateful that you have come all the way from Washington. Thank you, sir. I'm and we'd now like to hear you. Thank you. Over to you. Namaskar. Uh, <coughs> thank you so much for this great opportunity, Honorable Ambassador uh, Raghavan, Ambassador Patasati, Ambassador Lamba, uh, my fellow panelists, all friends and uh, colleagues uh, here. Uh, I would like to commend uh, ICWA for a great work they have done on uh, research on Gilgit Baltistan. I would like to commend IDSA for such a long commitment to Gilgit Baltistan. Um, and um, at this point, I would say that, you know, um, it's not really easy for anyone from Gilgit Baltistan to come here and say anything they want to because Indians know a lot and they read a lot about it. And, uh, it, uh, you know, one of the proof was. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Behoria's uh, uh, detailed uh, presentation about Gilgit Baltistan. Well, my topic is uh, on religion uh, in Gilgit Baltistan. Um, uh, before I start uh, with what has been happening now or in the past 20, 30 years, I'd like to tell that Gilgit Baltistan uh, has been a seat of learning for Hinduism for about 550 years. Uh, it was ruled by Hindu dynasties. Um, we had uh, a huge impact and influence of Bonism that uh, was widespread in Gilgit Baltistan and Tibet. Um, and then came Buddhism and uh, Gilgit and Baltistan became uh, one of the, the staging posts uh, we had universities, uh, famous universities, from where students went to Lhasa, and then the teachers went to Central Asia into Fargana Valley and other areas, and uh, there's a huge history of um, interconnectedness uh, with India and Central Asia through Gilgit Baltistan because of religion. Um, uh, about in 16th or 17th century, we had the Nurbakshis from Kashmir Valley, at that point, Kashmir Valley had a huge population of the Sufi Nurbakshis who had uh, earlier came from Iran 
from the Khorasan area. Uh, there were Sufis who from Khorasan went towards Turkey, uh, and they were called Rumi. And then there were Sufis, who, and then Baghdashis and uh, Abdalis, and then there were Sufis who came towards Gilgit, uh, Kashmir. They were called Kubravis and Hamadanis, and uh, when there were attacks from Afghans, and then there were attacks from Uyghurs, um, like Heather Gorgan, for instance, a famous name. He was uh, he was uh, an extremist Sunni, and he killed probably two to three hundred thousand uh, Sufi Nurbakshis in a year. Um, and the reason why he killed them because they offered their prayers with their hands down on the side, and he thought they were Shias. So, um, and then Sufis, the Nurbakshis, they came towards uh, Baltistan and Ladakh. So even today we have uh, a very uh, significant uh, population in district Ganche, for instance, has a huge, almost 70%, 65, 70% Nurbakshis. And uh, at some point, my valley, Shigar, was all Nurbakshi. And then, you know, there was influence from Iraq and Iran, and uh, they converted. Uh, they became Shias. Um, um, so today, the population of Gilgit Baltistan is, um, let's say, about 1.2 to 1.4 million. Um, and uh, about 50% of them would be Shias. Uh, it used to be a huge. Uh, uh, percentage. I will talk about that too. Uh, about 10 to 12 percent Ismailis, I would say. A huge pers uh, population, about 30 percent, uh, would be would be Sunnis, and and a few, three to four or five percent, would be Nurbakshis. Now here we are excluding about 100 to 150,000 Baltis, who almost 99 percent are Shia, but they don't live in Baltistan anymore. Um, they used to live in Shimla. Um, in uh, Dera Dune, in Missouri, in uh, Dharamshala, in uh, Dalhousie, Nainital, all these areas. And when the partition happened, and they heard that the Mahajira are getting land and houses in Karachi and Punjab, since they're going back to Gilgit Baltistan, they went straight to Karachi and Islamabad. And they have filthy rich people you know, with huge mansions. Uh, uh, many uh, got the title of Khan Bahadur and Sir from the British when they were in Shimla, like Sir uh, Badruddin and Sir Mahdi Shah. Uh, so uh, they're almost Shia. All, all of them are Shia, but they're not counted as part of Gilgit Baltistan today. So I'm sure if you count them, uh, you could add an another 10% Shias for Gilgit Baltistan. Um, from 1947, uh, to almost 1972, there was not a big change in Gilgit Baltistan. There was not any big volatility as far as sectarian issues are concerned. You know, almost all valleys up north, west, and east were either Shia or Ismaili. There were hardly any few thousand Sunnis uh, there. Uh, the Kashmiris who settled during the Dogra time, all the Kashmiris who settled in Baltistan, they became Shias. All the Kashmiris who settled in, in Gilgit city, they became Sunnis. And the, or the remain Sunnis in Kashrot area, for instance. The, the chief minister right now, he's from Kashrot. He's a, he's a Kashmiri, uh, Kashm of Kashmiri descent. He himself is not. And then, slowly, things started changing. We hear, as Dr. Behori has said about uh, Bhutto, he made a change uh, by giving some land to um, uh, China, as Ambassador Lamba mentioned. And during that time, you know, the construction of Karakram Highway, it started. Um, and at that time, Pakistan realized that this land is very important because of its uh, association with China. Uh, I do not want to go into relationship of China and Pakistan, how it evolved and eventually they became allies. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a separate topic, but they started as enemies. They were fighting against each other. China occupied some land of uh, Gilgit Baltistan, uh, fighting against Pakistan, and eventually, uh, they became allies uh, after whatever happened, Sento, Seattle, and then, you know, the Soviet-China uh, um, um, uh, rift. Um, so the Karakaram Highway changed a lot of things. For instance, it uh, compelled Pakistan to um, work with some elements within the local community to uh, remove uh, state subject rule. Now, state subject rule was there until then, and uh, Pakistanis were not settled there except probably a few uh, here and there. But after uh, 1970s, and th there's a whole story of how some local Shia mullahs, and there's some, uh, you know, they uh, colluded with the government, and um, 
some sectarian rifts were created and then there was this talk about you know becoming Pakistani and integrating into Pakistan and becoming uh, a province of Pakistan like Bhutto started this uh, a, a huge theory about Pakistan, uh, Kashmir, AJK being the fifth province Gilgit Baltistan being the sixth province. So eventually I think there were a lot of uh, you know, false hopes raised in Gilgit Baltistan and they let um, SSR go. And uh, then we have the Zia era. And during that time the Soviet war also started. Uh, uh, and uh, Zia ul was very smart. You know, even though he was a staunch Wahhabi, but he um, cultivated Iranian influence in Gilgit Baltistan. And he was very pro uh, Shia mullahs, uh, uh, pro in a sense that he gave them all the space they wanted to create this polarization in the society that would eventually threaten the small Sunni minority, feeling that you know if they, this is a sh huge Shia area and they're so powerful and you know their religion being uh, promoted in that way, then we need to align with the government and became the long arm of the state. So that's how uh, settlement started, and you know you will find a lot of information here at IDS said that how the demography of the Amir district, for instance, almost 100 percent change has occurred in, in the Amir, and, and then Gilgit city. I mean, a lot of people go there. I can't go. Uh, recently, my name was put on ECL along with Manzoor Pashtin and some other people. Uh, and the person who signed the documents, uh, he's a uh, deputy secretary in, in the home department. His name is, Je uh, is Mohammed Ziaul Haq. So, <laughs> coincidence. So, coincidence so, yeah, I can't go. But the people who go there, they tell, ki ji, humme, yani, do, teen ghante hum bazaar mein phirte hain, aur koi jana pehchane shakal hum dekh paate hain. That's how it has changed in Gilgit city. And I worked in Gilgit, I worked in Baltistan for a long time, and you know, it, it was changing slowly, and the market's coming up, and, and it's, it's very systematic. It's not like haphazard. It's not like, you know, yaha ap, yaha ap, aisa nahi hai. Here's a Gilgit city where the Shia majority live, and then on one side is the, the road that leads to Afghanistan, and then one side, it leads to China. It's like a, like a Y, right? And unki entrance pe jahan pe ja rahe hain, Pakistani population, sari lake, basri. So it's like, if it's a Y, Yahan se Pakistan hai, yahan China, yahan Afghanistan. These three pockets are hugely, um, and there's a huge influx of, of Pakistanis there. Obviously, uh, you know, Shia to nahi honge. So this is what, what's happening, uh, and it started happening after the Zia era, and then the Iranian revolution, and how the Afghan war all played into it. Um, I was there during uh, the Kargil war. Um, uh, Skardo, there were like about 60 houses where the Mujahideen were brought in and they were, you know, stationed there and um, they persecuted the local Shias, they would beat them, they would not eat from the, you know, from their hands, they would not buy meat from the Shia butchers, you know, like those kind of people like Harkatul uh, Ansar and all uh, people and uh, I remember when, when they left eventually uh, when we went inside those houses where they were stationed, there were like big holes made into the wall where they were putting big guns there uh, facing towards India. Uh, so I mean, uh, the, the demography and the environment and the ambience, everything changed so fast during that time uh, when Gilgit Baltistan became the play field of Iran and Saudi Arabia and you know how Pakistani military kind of uh, you know exploited the situation. Uh, then came 1988, you know, a, a huge massacre happened in, uh, in Gilgit, Baltistan, and I think that was a turning point for the local people. For the first time, there were people there who thought and realized that Pakistan is not a friend. It's not a benign benefactor. Uh, Sixteen villages were attacked, many of them were burned, you know, women were raped, local people were killed. Uh, many of them were just thrown into the Indus River, you know. Um, uh, Minister Qasim Shah, he was there and he was uh, uh, t taking part in, in that. Uh, Brigadier Aziz who later became General Aziz, uh, he was uh, offering people to ter become Muslim so their lives could be spared and he was, you know, announcing it openly. Aap sab musulman ho jayein, aap ko katal nahi kiya jayega. Uh, Colonel Aslam was there, you know, all these names, they, they, there's a book written uh, by a local person, uh, it's banned there now, it's called Shohdai Gilgit. Uh, and it's like about 400, 450 pages. I think I gave a copy to IDSA as well. Yeah. And it has a lot of detail, like testimonies of all the women 
who saw their, you know, fathers and brothers. Like there were old people who couldn't leave their homes. And what, what these militants did was that they wrapped them in their own, um, you know, quilts and their uh, beddings and they set them on fire where they were, they were alive. Uh, there were people who were uh, tied with ropes and then dragged behind moving jeeps till their heads fell off. You know, these kind of like statements came from the local people. And the best Pakistani government did was give each of them whose homes were burned 4 lakh rupiah. And that's it. You know, there was no commission. There was nothing to talk about how many um, uh, Shias were massacred. And this was the first time when the, the leading Shia ruler uh, Ghulam uh, Muhammad, he came on, on, uh, in, in the central mosque and he said, Aaj se hum India ko madad ke liye We'll call India because uske bina hum bach nahi sakte hain. So, you know, the news were sent to General Ziaul Haq and then he called the ceasefire. Uh, at, at, up, um, up until then, military was openly supporting the militants and the people, the Shias who were coming from Nagar Valley, to counter the militants, they were stopped. They were not allowed to come to, uh, uh, to the Gilgit city and surroundings. So there was a turning point uh, uh, when, when local people uh, realized. Um, and life was very different, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I give you my example, for instance. Uh, my, I am, I'm an offspring of uh, mother, father, both 12 or Shias. But my, but my father's mother is a Sunni. And many of his cousins are Nurbakshis and Sunni. And the, we used to have, you know, mixed marriages, but a time came when people were not even at speaking terms with each other. And a time came when there were bus routes where the Sunnis, you know, would have uh, five written, on, uh, the uh, Shias would have five written on their buses. Five is, is uh, the number of five infallibles for the Shias. And the Sunnis will have four written on it, which means four caliphs. And these were like different bus routes going in. And it was, it was segregated to that level. So uh, the, all that you know, Iranian and Saudi game and then Afghan all displayed into a situation where uh, society was completely broken and the fabric was destroyed. And that helped uh, Pakistan recruit people from Gilgit Baltistan. And, and then you heard, you know, uh, Khalid. Khorasani and all these from Baltistan emerging as Taliban spokesperson. So this was all created to eventually turn Gilgit Baltistan into, into a mess. So um, the society could be weakened, it could be divided, the Pakistanis could control it, but at the same time they could recruit a lot of people who would then eventually uh, you know, fight for, for the, for the uh, uh, Mujahideen. Um, I mean, today, uh, the Shias cannot even contest and win election from the Gilgit city where the Shias in majority, you know, because all the surrounding areas, they, they have been inhabited by, by outsiders. So I think uh, in, in 2008, then Agha Ziauddin was killed. I think he was a Gilgit Shia leader. And uh, that was one of the worst years since 2000, um, uh, uh, in 1988. Uh, for almost six months, there was a curfew. Um, Probably more than two or three hundred people were killed in uh, in Shia Sunni uh, warfare. The local people they uh, took control of the tehsil office. They burned down the tehsil office. They took control of the radio station. They said, "Ab India ko bulate And then after you know they announced it, then they said together, "Like, bula to lenge, phir kya hoga? Agar India ko pata hi na ho, India aaye na, to phir to mar bahut padegi." So eventually, you know. Um, uh, Colonel Vajahad, who is in exile right now, he was one. Of, he was a member uh, legislative assembly from Gilgit City, and he was, you know, part of that whole thing. Anyway, so you know, like, ऐसी बात नहीं है. I mean, I would uh, disagree with um, uh, Dr. Behori a little bit. जहाँ इन्होंने कहा 90 percent लोग पाकिस्तान के साथ जाते हैं. हम लोग कमरों में क्या बातें करते हैं? बाजार में क्या बातें करते हैं? पार्क में क्या बातें करते हैं या हमारे अपने हमें पता है ऐसा कुछ नहीं है आ, लेकिन हमें पता है इंटरनली कि हमारे लोगों की क्या हालत है और वो कितने तंग हैं और दे हैव सीन बलोच द बलोच आर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल पार्ट ऑफ पाकिस्तान दे हैव अ प्रोविंस दे हैव अ चीफ मिनिस्टर दे हैव अ गवर्नर दे हैव देयर ओन मिनिस्टर्स एंड दे नो हाउ दे आर ट्रीटेड इवन सिंधीज लुक एट फाइव करोड़ सिंधीज यू नो दे आर ट्रीटेड वर्स देन प्रॉब्ली पंजाबी सो हमारे लोगों को आइडिया है कि पाकिस्तान में उनको क्या होगा 
coming back to uh, uh, my point, then eventually CPEG came. And the CPEG, CPEG is, is a game changer. So now Pakistan thought that if there is a fight here, then CPEG will not happen. So then this, uh, you know, uh, uh, like um, uh, interfaith harmony and all these things started in Gilgit Baltistan and suddenly people who were thirsty for, you know, each other's blood, they were like, you know, drinking water from the same uh, uh, tap and stuff like that. So since then, you know, it's, it's been a year and a half, we haven't seen anything um, as far as sectarian um, uh, problems are concerned. But one thing that people realize is that the demographic change that we see is permanent. You know, uh, the, the Pakistanis, all of, almost all of them are uh, from a different uh, fa uh, religion or sect. They have an upper hand. The villages along the Karakram Highway up to Nagar district, they're pretty much like in a, either 50-50 or Sunni, Shias in minority. If you add Ismailis and Shias in some places, they're majority, but you know, it's, it's a pretty um, um, contested situation there. Um, so that is our, our biggest problem, you know, as uh, Honorable Speaker mentioned, Kargil Road will be calling here because of uh, the fact that Shias live on this side. Shia, um, uh, unity is, is, is definitely a big threat to, uh, to Pakistan. Um, today, I think one of the, the most um, uh, common demands of Gilgit Baltistan, Shia and uh, Sunni as well, many Sunnis, uh, Pr Professor Khushid, for instance, he's leading some uh, state subject uh, movement there. They want state subject rule. Why? Because even the Sunnis have realized that when you let the Pathans in, when you let the Punjabis in, so, you know what uh, Abul Kalam Azad said? Abhi to sare musulman hai, but once you create Pakistan, it'll be Punjabi versus the others. Phir waan musulman nahi hoga, then you know the massacre of the Bengalis started, now Baloch and all that. And this is exactly what's happening with the Sunnis now. So, today, even up to assistant commissioner level, people are coming from outside. There were times when, uh, when the commissioner came from Pakistan, people used to like protest. Abhi Commissioner, Sare Secretary, Sare Deputy Commissioner, Sare SP, Sare SSP, Sare DIG, IG, to the point that now Assistant Commissioner and uh, Assistant, uh, what's called uh, SP ki niche, DSP, DSP ki niche, ASP, ASP tak jo hain, wo Pakistan se So that is, you know, what the local Sunnis are also feeling that this is not something in their favor. Sare jobs jo hain bahar ja rahi hain. And this 2018, uh, order that uh, Dr. Behoria mentioned in a, in a lot of detail, what it allows Pakistanis to live and buy land in Gilgit Baltistan because all, all uh, the land is now at the disposal of Pakistani Prime Minister. So, what was the first thing? They had to have an approval from local revenue office in order for to somebody to have a domicile. And once you have a domicile, a Pakistani, then that person would be, uh, be able to purchase land. But no, not anymore. Now, anyone who from Islamabad gets a letter from Pakistani Prime Minister, according to this 2018 order, will be able to be a citizen of Gilgit Baltistan. So I think this is going to be a game changer with, the, with CPEC. Um, all right, way forward. I'm going to stop. I think my 15 minutes are over. You see, we always blame Pakistan <coughs> for demographic change and, you know, like uh, trying to oppress local people. But I think a little blame also lies uh, lie on, on our own people because our own people with the hope that one day they will be equal to the Punjabis and be a province in Pakistan, they also let this state subject rule go. They also uh, enable Pakistan to manufacture all those, you know, rules and regulations and control local people. And now they're realizing, and it's a bit too late, but I think, you know, uh, uh, I mean, a person like myself, for instance, you know, I, I've always said, I, when I came to IDS about 10 years ago, I started writing that we are Indian citizens, you know. Uh, I mean, there are nationalists who say, hum kuch bhi nahi hai. We're no man's land. You know, there are people who say I'm Pakistani, and I said, no, we're Indian citizens. I mean, all the binding laws and regulations and documents prove that we're Indian citizens. You know, there, there's, there's no turning away from this fact. And we need to establish relationship with India and eventually, you know, become part of India, become part of Ladakh, and that is the only way we can save ourselves. 
you know, pa Pakistan is not what they have done to Bengalis in Baloch, you know, Gawadar mein Baloch minority ho gaye hain, Karachi mein koi Sindhi nahi raha hai, and in Pashtun, look at Pashtun, you know, their houses have been bombed, and you know, they, they live like refugees in other parts of Pakistan. So I think this is something, the way forward, that our nationalists are very confused. They, ha they live in this imaginary bubble that they will have their own country. They don't understand there's a China there. If you become your own country, let's say, I don't know, first of all, it's not a possibility. I mean, even United Nations resolution does not allow that. But even if you become a country, you will be a satellite of China. And then what, whatever is happening to Tibetans and Uyghurs will happen to us. So probably worse than that because our population is only a million. You know, the, over there Uyghurs are probably about eight or nine million, and, and they're still struggling to to have a semblance of you know their own identity and stuff. So I believe that you know the way forward is that whether the nationalists are a huge number or a small number, we need to cl be clear in our future approach, and we need to build alliances with India and the international community and try to save ourselves because uh, after CPEC and you know all this order 2018 all that I don't think that uh, locals will be the beneficiary uh, if, 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 if ever to be developed into you know uh, the, the modern Hong Kong or Singapore whatever uh, Pakistan try to call it. Thank you so much I'll stop here. Thank you for giving us a first-hand account and also suggesting a way forward. When you mentioned that the Shia population was 60 percent, uh, Mr. Ashok Bairia showed me the figures which I like to share with you that in 1948 the Shia population of the area was 85 percent. So this is how the demography has changed. <coughs> and with that I now request Dr. Shri Shukla of the ICWA who has been involved with this program right from the beginning because he has been in, uh, spoken to me a few times. Uh, so I now request him to uh, speak on Chinese involvement in GB, which is an important aspect of our discussion. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, at the outset, let me accept that I am under pressure because who's who of Pakistan is present here. My own mentor, Ashok Behoria sir, has made a presentation. He was the one who brought me to IDSA. And speaking to such an audience is a challenge. But let me, let me give it a try. Uh, this is the brief outline of my presentation. I have to speak on some of these aspects. Uh, before I come to the real issue, Chinese involvement, I have to talk about the geostrategic importance, end of Raj and how Pakistan illegally occupied the territory and then we have to discuss all these things. But since we don't have enough time uh, left, so I have to rush through. So the coming uh, to the first slide, which I have uh, you know, titled as Geostrategic Importance of GB. Uh, the present-day Gilgit Baltistan is a territory illegally occupied by Pakistan since 1947. It has a unique geostrategic location where the boundaries of three nuclear powers, China, India, and Pakistan, as well as Afghanistan and Tajikistan converge. The numerous traditional passes existing in the region had been used by a number of invaders in the past as a gateway to India. These passes were also instrumental in socio-economic and religio-cultural transactions between India and rest of the world. Given this geostrategic importance, the Sikhs of Punjab the Dogras of Jammu and the British developed an interest to bring the area under their uh, direct control. You would remember the first Anglo-Sikh War, 1845-46, between, between the Sikh Empire and the British East India Company that resulted in the Sikh Kingdom surrendering the Jalandhar Dwab, a very important region of that, that territory. The British were also to be paid rupees 15 million as indemnity failing which the Sikh Kingdom, the Sikh Kingdom ceded Kashmir and Hazara to the British. Soon after that, they had a treaty called Amritsar, Treaty of Amritsar, 1846, under which Gulab Singh, Maharaja Gulab Singh of Jammu, acquired Kashmir from the British and thus came to be known as the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. Later in 1935, the British Cox Maharaja, Maharaja Hari Singh, the then ruler of Jammu and Kashmir to lease the Gilgit Agency for the next 60 years and that happened. 
the lease agreement which which came into effect i think on march 26 1935 clearly underlined that the viceroy and governor general of india would take over only the civil and military administration whereas the territory would continue to be under the dominion of the maharaja now we all know that with the end of raj in 1947 the lease was terminated in july at least in july i think and the gilgit agency reverted back to its original ruler maharaja hari singh soon after appointed brigadier ghansara singh as mentioned by ambassador lambai at the beginning uh, as the new wazir e wazarat the governor however major william brown uh, the british commander of gilgit scouts not only organized a revolt and arrested ghansara singh he also handed over the area to pakistan that's how pakistan came into the occupation of gb it was followed by pakistan sending tribal raiders and regular forces also disguised as raiders into the other parts of kashmir and it was under these circumstances that maharaja acceded to india and since then the territory became an inalienable part of uh, jammu and kashmir and also the india after which the indian armed forces started pushing back the raiders as well as regulars who were disguised as raiders at the time of declaration of cease fire in 1949 january 1949 Uh, Pakistan however remained in possession of a large territory of Jammu and Kashmir including Mirpur Muzaffarabad and Gilgit Baltistan Everybody talked about the ambiguous political status people of Gilgit Baltistan have today In fact the people of GB have no representation in the Majlis Shura the Pakistani parliament The territory has not figured in any of the three constitutions adopted by Pakistan 1956 62 and 73 even POK's interim constitution 1974 did not refer to the area as its part Pakistan has not only neglected isolated and disenfranch disenfranchised the people it could never justify or clarify GB's undefined and unambiguous status to people there and outside world as well instead of addressing some of these genuine concerns of the people the political security elites of pakistan have decided to use the strategically located territory for proxy wars in the region a number of terrorist outfits and training camps belonging to uh, lashkar e taiba harkatul mujahideen jaish e mohammed hizbul mujahideen al badr and harkatul ansar they all exist and operate from that area only there have also been moves to infect the area with extremist ideologies pakistan has also been trying to change the demography as mentioned by the earlier speakers by bringing people from other areas and settling them into gb coming back to the chinese engagement how it all began uh, many people think that pakistan is realized the importance of kkh but it was the other way around i mean chinese realized the importance of kkh and that's why they pushed pakistan so i'll come to that later you know pakistan and china refer each other as iron brothers when when chinese refer them they they say iron brothers and when pakistan is called them they call all weather friends until recently i mean they used to define them the, this friendship as deeper than the deepest ocean higher than the highest mountain and sweeter than the sweetest honey however due to the increasing chinese presence especially after the launch of cpec the nature of sino pakistan relationship is undergoing a change and, and this is reflected in the way two countries now refer each other in public domain in october 2018 when imran khan was preparing for his china visit foreign minister shah mahmood qureshi underlined that regardless of domestic or international changes this close friendship has served as a model of state to state relations for other countries he further added that the two countries were all weather strategic cooperative partners remember the difference they were all weather friends now they are becoming all weather strategic cooperative partners and the chinese foreign minister kong kong xuanyo i for forgive me if i am pronouncing it incorrectly who in the backdrop of pulwama terror attack and balakot strike visited pakistan on march 6 stressed that pakistan and china were all weather strategic partners 
the world all weather friendship has gone now they are strategic partners and this happened in less than a decade now coming back to the gb factor how it factors in the sino park relationship it is important to understand that during the growing sino indian tussle over the border ayub khan came up with a demarcation proposal which culminated into a border agreement under which pakistan surrendered about 2500 square miles of indian territory to china given the territorial vul vulnerability of its western flank which includes shanxi xinhai sichuan yunnan qiaochou ningxia xinjiang inner mongolia kansu and chongqing china pushed pakistan for karakoram highway project it was china that pushed pakistan for the project the project commenced in 1964 and got completed in 1978 as you all know it is one of the highest paved international roads in the world which connects kashgar in xinjiang uyghur region of china with gilgit baltistan the highway in fact strengthens pakistan's hold over the illegally occupied territory general pervez musharraf in his autobiography in the line of fire a memoir mentions uh, refers this highway as the eighth wonder of the world his advent to power as the president of pakistan coincided with china's open up the west or go west strategy which was primarily aimed to reduce the fast growing socio economic development gap between the weak western flank and a well off but far away coastal provinces and it was during his tenure agreements and mous were signed to to rebuild and upgrade the karakoram highway so that its potential could be fully utilized now we come back to the cpc you know in 2013 i think the pakistani president zardari and chinese premier li keqiang in principle agreed to enhance mutual connectivity in april 2015 during his visit to pakistan chinese president xi jinping announced the construction of cpc the proposed corridor roughly a 2700 km route aims to connect pakistani port city gwadar in baluchistan to china's kashgar in xinjiang the common narrative propagated by both pakistan and china emphasizes on the benefits of connectivity and other related projects to the people of the region singe is the best person to tell how how much they are benefiting there on the surface of it it appears to be an economic project however it has deep geopolitical and geo strategic meaning the cpc also connects at least three information black holes of the region which nobody talks about baluchistan gilgit baltistan and xinjiang the world community by and large is not aware of the fast changing ground situation in all these three regions now coming back to how islamabad is using the cpc to tighten its grip over the territory and people in the wake of increasing chinese presence islamabad seeks to further tighten its grip on the region from gwadar which is the entry point to gilgit baltistan which is the exit point of cpc security establishment has increased its presence and they have adopted an iron hand approach to deal with any dissent in january 2017 Pakistan army raised a 13700 strong special security division to protect CPC it is composed of nine army battalions and six civil wings besides besides pakistani forces there are reports suggesting a significant presence of chinese troops in the area maybe senge would be able to throw some light on that during q and a the new york times in 2010 reported and i think the who was the writer i'm forgetting his name is a pakistani uh, had estimated that are about 7 to 11000 pla soldiers were present on the ground later in 2015 chinese troops were spotted by indian armed forces at the line of control abdul hamid khan who is the chairman of balwaristan national front he argues that they have to build many cantonments in gilgit baltistan and both 
China and Pakistan will station their huge divisions of army. In July 2018, Indian Army again reportedly spotted the presence of senior PLA officials in the Nogam sector of um, so sector in North Kashmir. Then there were reports about Chinese plans to establish three divisions under a local name in, in Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Remember the consequences. What would happen? Three divisions mean 30,000 troops. What, what they are going to do there? Exploitation of natural resources. <coughs> uh, in order to achieve CPEC objectives, Pakistan and China have been cursing, crushing the legitimate concerns of the local populace. If there is no transparency, transparency regarding CPEC, which we all know, in Pakistan as a whole, then one can imagine the situation about GB. Why would you have a transparency in GB when you don't have transparency in overall CPC routes? People feel that under the garb of developmental projects, Pakistan and China have been exploiting precious natural resources of the region. It is no secret that Islamabad is forcibly acquiring land and displacing people. Most of the lands were forcefully acquired by Pakistani army and those opposing were either killed, silenced or incarcerated without any trial. Now coming back to the statement by Wazahat Hassan, the chairman of Gilgit Baltistan Thinkers Forum. He is of the view that thousands had their land snatched and occupied by the military authorities and their agencies. Under this black draconian rule, nobody can raise their voice against CPEC. There is also an ecological angle to, in respect of all the CPEC projects in GB. And no studies are known to have been undertaken about the possible ecological impact of these projects. Many fear the manner, in, manner of implementation in which they are trying to implement these projects. They are in violation of environmental safety norms. Those raising their voices are being arrested, tortured and imprisoned on false charges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shukla for a detailed and very interesting account of Chinese involvement. And with that, I come straight to the question-answer session. Uh, I would request you to be brief and, uh, and please mention your name and the person to whom the, you are the first person to raise your hand. Uh, yes, yes. Can I make a comment or do I have to? Well, very brief, if you may, because time, we are already running short, but... So, uh, I don't know if Mr. Sering speaks Balti. My name is Ambassador Deepak Vora. I'm a special advisor to the Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council in Kargil, involved in development. Just wanted to say, sir, Salam Shokju. Jale. Jule, sir. Sir, um, I have a chance to go very frequently to <coughs> Kargil and speak to people there. So, just to remind you that in 1947, what had happened at St. Joseph's Convent in in Baramulla is well known there how German nuns there were violated by the so-called Lashkar. 1999 there was a similar fear sir. And today when I see Baltis who come to Kargil to meet their families, the one thing they ask me is, Aap to Rajdut hain, hame yahan Is there any way that you can extend our stay here? And we say we can't do it sir. And then I tell them, look you have security in your own part of um, Gilgit Baltistan because the army is there. Sir, the response I'm ashamed to say this, but I will. The response I hear across the board is, Bahut achche log hain Pakistani army, beti maa ko utha ke le jate hain, subere lota dete hain. And I said, we have the army here too. They say, ye to hamare rakhwale hain. I just wanted you to be aware, sir, that the angst, the anger and the anguish, probably in two or three hundred conversations I've had, I feel it, sir. May Allah bless you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, General Chopra, I would be very interested in uh, Mr. Senge, this way forward. Is this sentiment shared by the Sunni element despite the fact that they are much lesser in number? Is it all a Shia? He's talked about the Baltis also. And we are going to discuss later on the Pakistani concern regarding India. Will somebody educate me regarding the Indian concern? Regarding, regarding this area and what is the view there and the CPEC, the second problem very quickly. 
what is the what is the chances of sweepec succeeding when in my view that entire area has always been a stone age how are they going to absorb all this that is being brought in i don't think it's 62 billion dollars i think it's about 19 20 but the word bandied is that so if you i forget we told about these two issues thank you chair yes please so i mean i know a person personally who i uh, was very happy when he he's a military uh, personnel in when he was posted to kishan ganga on pakistani side it's called neelam he was very happy and um, it's it's very unfortunate that you know we're talking about this in in this way and i was i was like aapki kitni khushi kyon ho rahi hai and he said kyunki wahan par jo hai hame bahut khuli azadi hai wahan ladkiyan bahut achhi hain local so you know agar ek chote level ka personnel को इतनी वो है परमिशन है तो आप सोच सकते हैं ऑफिसर्स वहाँ क्या करते होंगे यू नो देर पिक्चर्स एंड वीडियोज ऑफ वेमेन फ्राम किशन गंगा प्रोटेस्टिंग अगेंस्ट पाकिस्तानी मिलिट्री इन मुर्दाबाद एंड ऑल दैट सो इट्स वेरी अनफॉर्चुनेट दैट येस पाकिस्तान वट देव डन टू पश्तून वट देव टू बंगालीज वट देर डूंग टू बलोच नाउ यू नो देव डेक देर वेमेन एंड यूज दैम एज वॉर टूल्स एंड एक्सप्लोइ दैम अनफॉर्चुनेटली वेल आई मीन इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू से कि क्या परसेंटेज ऑफ विच एथनिक और रिलीजियस कम्युनिटी वुड बी विलिंग टू यू नो सी इंडिया इज अ फेवरेबल ऑप्शन बट एज डॉक्टर अदालत वुड नो दैट देर इज देर इज अ वेरी यू नो साइजेबल पॉपुलेशन ऑफ सेक्युलर सुन्नीस हु सी पाकिस्तान इज अ प्रॉब्लम आई डोंट नो अबाउट देयर फीलिंग्स अबाउट इंडिया बट दे डेफिनेटली सी पाकिस्तान एज अ नो नो इट्स इट्स नॉट एन ऑप्शन फॉर दैम Uh, but again you know the, our society for the last 20 30 years has been very much polarized on sectarian basis and unfortunately what happens is that jab ek community kehti hai we need apples to dusra kehta nahi oranges right you know it's it's just a general uh, knee jerk reaction ki humne usko oppose karna hi karna hai for local political purposes as well so if somebody likes uh, imran khan the other will you know definitely go towards nawaz sharif so it's it's very hard to uh, judge uh i mean this is this is a very you know a different issue and i think uh, s- someone has to be very very bold to uh speak up and and uh, talk in that manner i think cpec if if you would like to. you know it's difficult to say that whether cpec cpec would succeed or fail but the given the nature of pakistani state the probability is this that it might not succeed however when people compare uh, pakistan with sri lanka i think it's unfair Sri Lankan experiment may not be repeated in Pakistan. It's difficult. Pakistan is having sixth or seventh largest military, standing military, which Sri Lanka does not have, and Pakistan also having proxy forces, which Sri Lanka I don't think they will be in a position to use against any nation. So when people compare that, look what happened in Sri Lanka, that might happen to Pakistan. It's I think it's unfair. Well, I spotted three uh, just more. यू आर द फर्स्ट वन राइट एट द बैक वो उनको पीछे दीजिएगा प्लीज मैंशन योर नेम हेलो आई एम अनवर अली आई एम फ्रॉम कारगिल एंड माई क्वेश्चन इज जब वहाँ से लोग आते हैं गिलगित बल्तिस्तान से जो यहाँ से नाइनटीन सेवेंटी वन में या उससे पहले वहाँ पर डिवाइड होकर उस साइड में रहे तो उनको क्यों मतलब यहाँ पे आ, आते वक्त उनको अपनी फैमिली से डिवाइडेड फैमिली से सही से मिलने नहीं दिया जाता या उनके उनको अपने गांव में जिस गांव से वो बिछड़े हैं उन गांव में जाने नहीं दिया जाता ये एक बात है और दूसरी बात ये है कि इंडियन गवर्नमेंट क्यों कोई इनिशिएटिव नहीं लेता कि कारगिल स्कर्दो रोड या नुबरा खपुलंग रोड को खोला जाए इससे कल्चरल कल्चरली जो हमारे कल्चर और लैंग्वेज इस ऑन द वर्च ऑफ एक्सटेंट है उसको मतलब एक सपोर्ट मिलेगा और ये भी हो सकता है और वहाँ के लोग जान पाएंगे कि यहाँ कितनी डेवलपमेंट है इंडिया में कितनी डेवलपमेंट है वहाँ के लोग वो जान पाएंगे ये भी एक कंपेरेटिव होगी और तीसरी बात क्यों वहाँ के स्टूडेंट्स को और वहाँ के स्कॉलर्स को इंडियन यूनिवर्सिटीज़ में सीट्स रिजर्व नहीं किया जाता या स्कॉलरशिप नहीं दिया जाता अगर ये दें तो वहाँ के लोग भी इंस्पायर होंगे यहाँ पे आके पढ़ें और यहाँ के तहजीब को और यहाँ की डेवलपमेंट्स को जाने बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया ये दो इनको दीजिएगा इनको एंड इन द नेक्स्ट लॉट थैंक यू सर 
मेरा नाम करताक कपूर है आई एम स्टूडेंट ऑफ बैलेंस कम्पेटिव स्टडीज इन द एवोल्यूशन ऑफ हिस्ट्रीज हिस्ट्री इज माई सब्जेक्ट सर मैं एक से एक ही से विषय पर कहना चाहूँगा कोई डेमोग्राफी के ऊपर सवाल उठाया गया है ऑल नेशन ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड नो मैटर हु और दे आर ऑल प्रोटेक्टिंग द डेमोग्राफिक सेटअप इन दिस्पेक्टिव रीजन टू देर एडवांटेज टू देर एडवांटेज हिंदुस्तान ही एक ऐसा देश है जो डेमोग्राफी को अपने एडवांटेज के लिए कुछ काम नहीं करता है उसके बारे में मैं कुछ कहना चाहूँगा देखिए सवाल आज गिलगित बाल्टिस्तान का है पाकिस्तान में भी ये हुआ वहाँ पर सारी फोर्सेस उसको जो ज्वाइनिंग फोर्सेस नेशंस हैं वो सारे के सारे उसकी जो डेमोग्राफी है अपने एडवांटेज की तरफ उसको मोड़ रहे हैं जैसे चाइना भी अपने इलाके में मोड़ रहा है और हर देश में मोड़ है ब्रिटिश गाना में भी यही हुआ जहाँ भी इंडियन फिफ्टी से ऊपर जाते हैं उनको नीचे कर दिया जाता है यही यहाँ बाल्टिस्तान में भी यही कुछ हुआ है कंबोडिया में भी वही कुछ हुआ था जो बाल्टिस्तान में हुआ है जहाँ पर क्योंकि प्रो इंडियंस जो है मोर देन फिफ्टी है इसलिए वहाँ उन्होंने स्टेप लिया तो मेरा प्रश्न ये है अगर दूसरे नेशन अपने यहाँ डेमोग्राफी को अपने एडवांटेज में डाइवर्ट करते हैं तो हम ऐसा करने के क्यों क्यों हिचकचाते हैं हम उस तक सोचते भी नहीं है क्या ये क्राइम नहीं है थैंक यू यस जेंटलमैन इन ब्लैक शर्ट हेलो सर आई एम सुयो स्टूडेंट ऑफ सेंट स्टीफेंस कॉलेज सर एज यू हाईलाइटेड द सोशल इकोनॉमिक डेटा एंड कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन एंड पॉलिटिकल पोजिशन ऑफ द पीपल इट डजेंट इट अपियर दैट पाकिस्तान इज कमिटिंग द सेम मिस्टेक दैट इट कमिटेड इन बांग्लादेश एंड इफ इट्स एंड इफ इट इज सो देन वॉट इज द रीजन दैट स्टिल मेजोरिटी पीपल ऑफ गिलगिट बाल्टिस्तान want to be a part of pakistan and why do not they look for an alternative option and what should be india strategy to reach out to the people of gilgit baltistan well i think aap ko jo ashok sir jo indian government kyun nahi karti mujhe nahi pata kyun nahi karti ashok so i don't kyun ji ha i think kyun nahi karte mujhe kya pata aap kyun nahi karte well ha ji no no you see na, you know in social uh, social uh, sciences they're just saying nothing is cast in stone things may change right and uh, but what we took stock of was the ground situation today uh, my good friend senge differed with me about the popular uh, orientation that one gets to see i agree with him people uh, people in people in that region they would tell you something in public and something else in private uh, i think people of subcontinent are notorious for that so it's not it's not true of them alone but the thing is uh, uh, the kind of uh, support that mukti bhai ne had or people from bangladesh had uh, from india uh, is not is absent here you know that is why i was just going over i was trying to locate it i finally located it you know the uh, it was in 2008 that we uh, sent out this uh, uh, note to the ministry and usme hum sab likhe the ke yaar agar aap usko citizen mante hain to kuch special status dijiye kuch special document dijiye i think senge you were part of us at that point of time or you had left you had just left perhaps so uh, and we had also enumerated uh, some other points as well why there should be uh, white papers on uh, situation in pok because if you consider it is uh, it as your own just a solitary resolution sometime in 1994 doesn't make sense or somewhere you know from a political platform or some other platform if you make a voice it doesn't matter you have to be consistent and uh, in a in a country of 1.3 billion people how many people are there who are focusing on pok how how emotional we are about pok we are only reminded of pok when you have some problem with pakistan so this is this is something that is not going to work as much as we know i i'm, I'm delighted to see so much of people here you know to uh, hear us out you know all this bakwas about the pok here but you know the problem is you, you have to find a way of translating into translating it into policy this is not forthcoming and i'm sorry to say that you know we have you know government has uh, government has sponsored this uh, project that we have in idsa for last 11 years 
but it remains a project. And all that inputs that we get uh, send out are uh, lost in the government files. Nothing happens. So in that sense, I will I will also tell you another thing. You know, I am I, I was personally in touch with some of the nationalists in that terrain, and Senge is right. You know, there is such, such a uh, such fear about you know being uh, branded as pro-Indian in that terrain. Uh, apart from I think Senge and another person, Abdul Hamid Khan who have gone out and people staying in that terrain are very very shy of you know putting out their emotions uh, in favor of India and this is something that we have to take note of because because of our uh, lack of effort to reach out to them to nurture them to nourish them uh, otherwise you know nothing is going to happen uh, for example I will tell you and I will end here you know uh, Baba Jan for example he, he has become uh, a symbol of you know, kind of nationalism in uh, that terrain. Uh, but whatever he may, he may be a nationalist in private, uh, but uh, during this present uh, India-Pakistan and uh, you know confrontation, he even from prison, I think he issued a statement that I am ready to fight the Indian forces on the line of command, uh, line of control. So that is the sentiment. You know, fear has worked in case of Pakistan. How much of persuasion? How much of Emotional uh, inroad we can make into that terrain depends on the kind of policies we structure. And for that, we have to unassumedly and unabashedly we have to pursue this policy rather than you know just making out one policy statement here uh, and there. I would like to it. add a few words uh, before Dr. Sengupta, uh, probably he will have a question. Like in any society, it doesn't happen that when 100% of people are ready, then you will start. कोई भी सोसाइटी की जहाँ भी आप मूवमेंट देखें वो लेफ्ट मूवमेंट देखें राइट मूवमेंट देखें फ्रेंच रेवोल्यूशन देखें वो पांच छह परसेंट लोग होते हैं जिन्होंने उसको स्पीयर हेड किया होता है इवन ये आपका गिलगित स्काउट का है ये सारी मेथ पाकिस्तान ने क्रिएट की जनता ने किया ये किया कुछ नहीं किया जनता को कुछ पता नहीं था ये दत्ता खेल ऑपरेशन हुआ दस पंद्रह बीस सोल्जर्स थे और उन्होंने उसका यू ना स्नोबॉल इफेक्ट हुआ एंड इवेंचुअली बहुत से वहाँ के जो राजा थे जो महाराजा हरी सिंह के फेवर में थे they had to go and keep quiet. Jashuru mein, Punyal ka raja, you know, he came out with weapons and said, I'll fight for Maharaja. And then when he saw the temperature in Gilgit, shooting up, so what I'm trying to say is that I think this is not a determining factor that you can tell us that you are 15%, 20%, 30%, this is not a determining factor. It's not a determining factor. Things happen differently. Well, we will take another three or four questions. You will be next. Well, in, re in response to a question on demography, all I want to say is that democracies react differently from dictatorships. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I've worked on cross-LOC trade, and unfortunately, cr uh, the cross-LOC trade was just restricted to LOC West and LOC East. That's uh, Mirpur, Muzaffarabad, and thing. And one of the things that came out was the breaking down of shibboleths. There were so many misconceptions about what used to happen in Jammu and Kashmir, that's an Indian administered part, that broke down as a result of this people to people contract as well as trade. That has not been allowed to happen when it comes to uh, GB and Ladakh. And that you referred to, I think, the beautiful term, those black hole of information. That has not been allowed to be breached because there are so many things we don't know about GB and there are so many things that GB does not know about Ladakh and the way that the rest of India and Jammu Kashmir is uh, administered. One brief point, there are lots of WhatsApp groups uh, where people both in GB as well as mm. Kargil are members of. I would request you to just, you know, Look into the conversations that take place in these particular groups and you will be surprised to know what goes on. You know, I've, I was privy to one such group. The comments are amazing. The comments are amazing. So I think that is one facet we need to look into. But as he said, we've basically done a policy. We are part to, party to a policy whereby GB remains a black hole where information is concerned. Well, you know, uh, as you know that this trade can only take place if both sides agree. 
Pakistan has not been keen to open the Kablo Leh or the Skardu Kargil link. So it had already been suggested that they didn't want. They can't. Who? Anyone else? Yes. I was going to answer. Just one moment. Yes, you and these only two more. You have asked one. Madam. Yes, well, well, uh, 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 after, uh, yes, the first one, give it to the lady. She, we have not had a, uh, right. can I ask? Yes, you can. Thank you. Uh, this is Surendra. Give your, uh, mention your name, please. Uh, I am Surendra Mohan. I uh. teach international relations at University of Jammu. Right. Uh, my question is for all panel. Anyone can ask, uh, answer this. Uh, <laughs> actually, Gilgit Baldistan, I feel that it is a multi-corner contest between China, India, Pakistan. No, recently from this panel we come to know that Supreme Court of Pakistan is also a part of that. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, the separatists in Kashmir, of course they are also. So my point here is, uh, China wants actually, Pakistan should accord a status, permanent status to Gilgit Baltistan so that CPEC would be a kind of permanent, you know, a third party maybe. So, uh, but Kashmiri separatists want that uh, Pakistan should not do it because that would betray the Kashmir problem, the Kashmir issue. And uh, Supreme Court has recently said that, no, you should give the more rights to uh, Gilgit Baltistan and all. Fine. And all these situations, I feel it play out in favor of Islamabad. They do not want, they want to continue their atrocities in Gilgit Baltistan or their autocratic this this thing, but Supreme Court's decision is favoring only the human side, but not the legal side. I feel that what is the way out? So uh, this was the question. Uh, uh, let's have one or the other question. Three questions. Yes. Please. Just a very, uh, just a very brief Jet question. Uh, and this is actually for Ambassador Lama, uh, since you represent the government or represented it at any case. Um, have we ever, uh, in any concerted fashion, uh, put together a dossier on human rights atrocities in GB and presented it to various uh, human rights bodies, international bodies? I mean, Pakistan does that all the time, the OIC, the UN, uh, HCR. Uh, have we ever done any of this? Because from the accounts from, uh, Mr. from Dr. Shering and elsewhere, I mean, what's happening is, is pretty awful. Yes, and if we have the information, why aren't we doing it? Uh, in Geneva, at the Human Rights uh, Subcommittee meeting, these have been given uh, on different occasions. Those years, sir. They have been given. But no concerted? No yes. No. They, they, they have been given. Uh, uh, <laughs> his question would be... Uh, uh, cross a low sea trade and comes. Sir knows better. I shouldn't jump in here. But in a cross LOC trade and cross LOC travel, that was part of the uh, negotiations, back channel negotiations that was going on at that point of time. I personally believe it was not designed to wrest uh, POK from Pakistan and merge with this part of India. You know, this is this is something was different from that. So I don't believe that you know this Kardu, uh, this uh, lay. Uh, Skardu Kargil route or Khabla Nubra route uh, will also uh, go beyond uh, the, the, the commonsensical, what do you say, frame of reference in India about a possible solution to the Kashmir issue, which has been around the LOC, right? So this is something that we have to ponder over. Uh, cross LOC trade is fantastic, I remember. I, I, I know because you could trade banana and coconut there even if they are not grown in Jammu and Kashmir. <laughs> that is interesting. No, that is, that is part of India-Pakistan reconciliation. But I don't know whether you, know, you can use it. No, no, I'm coming to that. Whether you can use it because that, that had a purpose. That had a purpose which was about India-Pakistan reconciliation. That is not about resting POK from Pakistan. But if you want to leverage that, you know, use it as an asymmetric prop, uh, then uh, you have to act accordingly. But I must, you know, I'm provoked to uh, uh, say this. Uh, 
Yes, officially we have advanced this Skardu Kargil route, but we also must recognize so there is a constituency in the state of Jammu and Kashmir which is dead opposed to that. They do not want Peter this to come up. Yeah. And purely, purely because of communal reasons. So are we are we able to are we are we able to scale that and do it? So we have to also keep that in mind. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Kudana Khasta, Kartarpur corridor was basically was our uh, initiative. We wanted Pakistan to grant it, 1990s. When they started uh, uh, reverting to us, we were foxed. We didn't know what to do. Tomorrow, if Pakistan comes and tells you that we will open Skardu Kargil route, will you be in a position to accept it? I do not know. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to, we have to discuss it. Of course we will, of course we But sir, the resistance that is there, you have to take note. They can I mean, you know, things could be dealt differently. India has been asking Pakistan on so many times. And as far as Gilgit Baltistan and India is concerned, we are on the same page. It's in our interest. So, a different strategy, Hosepi, for instance, one thing that I think might work for Pakistan is that tent on LOC on both sides. Absolutely, LOC on both sides, literally, from the camera to walk on the camera. आप टेंट लगा दें, उसमें कुछ कुर्सियां लगा दें, चार पाइयां लगा दें, और जो ह्यूमैनिटेरियन इश्यू है कि जो 60 प्लस के लोग हैं, उनकी तलाशी लेके बिल्कुल नंगा करके भी उनको कहें, he is not a threat anymore, he can walk across and meet his relatives, stay there for six hours or twelve hours, जितने भी आप लोगों को उसकी हो सुविधा, and then he can go back. तो you don't have to deal Gilgit Baltistan exactly like Muzaffarabad जहाँ से ट्रक जा रहे हैं। आप बिल्कुल एलएसी पे तंबू लगा के वहीं बिठा के उनको रोने धोने के गले वाले मिलके उनको कहें वापस चले जाएं। And this is how something like you know icebreaker क्योंकि पाकिस्तान कभी नहीं चाहेगा। I mean I was giving interview to some friend in DC और मैंने उसको कहा कि if you look at different issues whether it's in this water treaty whether it's Kargil Road, whether it's uh, promotion of our language and identity, promotion of our, you know, culture and religion. Gilgit Baltistan and India are literally on the same page. Whatever Gilgit Baltistan wants to do doesn't threaten India, but it threatens Pakistan. Aap loon ko hamare Shia religion ko phelane se koi threat nahi. Aap ko hamari language ya hamare Tibet ke jo connection hai, usse koi threat nahi. आपके यहाँ पे तो हर लैंग्वेज को इतना ज़्यादा जो है ना रिस्पेक्ट होती है। आपको इंडस वाटर ट्रीटी को ये बहाना बना के दे डिप्राइव अस ऑफ़ हार रॉयल्टी एंड गिव इट टू पाकिस्तानी प्रोविंसेस। एंड इफ़ यू कैंसल इट विल बी थैंकफुल टू यू। एंड एंड इन द सेम वे करगिल रोड यू नो यू वांट टू do it in a different way. Well, the interests coincide, but I can tell you that so far there has been uh, only negative attitude to this Kardu Kargil link from Pakistan's side. You know, the, that's the last one. Well, the last question amongst those who have asked after Hajiya, and I think there's no other, that will be the last question. Uh, we'll have, and with that we'll end. SS, I don't want to come between you and the lunch. S.S. Bhakri from Institute of UN and UNESCO Studies. It is a three-word question. Anybody can answer. Who declared the ceasefire in January 1949? Johala Nehru, Sheikh Abdullah or somebody else? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Lama, can you share the, our Indian policy about this POK? We never claim to take back this POK. We just say it's a POK. All this government, whenever they talk, they never talk about the POK. What is future prospect? I think the POK policy is very clearly stipulated in the 1993 Parliament resolution and requires no further elucidation. Uh, it's very clear cut uh, that it is a part of uh, the... Urdu mein hum log kehte hai na You will answer, you have also already answered I think the ceasefire Hamari lini China se dar ke le lo bhai 
Well, with that, we come to an end to this session. I'd like to thank all of you, particularly the audience, for the uh, interest you have taken. And I think uh, we are continuing the next session uh, we'll carry forward. Thank you. Thank you.